It's a pleasure and an honor to introduce John Muir Laws. John is one of the giants of outdoor education. That's not just because he's excellent at teaching people about nature, but also because of the ways that he integrates multiple modes of interacting with the environment, including observation, drawing, and journaling, sight, language, and action. When I've worked with Jack, I've been continually impressed with his insights into the processes of learning and the creative ways that he puts the pieces together. His workshops and classes, which are highly sought after, range from useful drawing techniques to seeing the world with new ways to use language to interact with nature, to stewardship, to helping students move well beyond their own preconceptions about whether they're good artists. Jack received his bachelor's degree here at UC Berkeley and his master's degree from the University of Montana. He's a research associate at the California Academy of Sciences. He's also on the Education Committee of the California Native Plant Society, on the board of the Golden Gate Audubon Society, and on the advisory board for the Lawrence Hall of Science Beatles Project, also known as Better Environmental Education, Teaching, Learning, Expertise, and Sharing. His work is an illustrator for National Geographic, the Nature Conservancy, and the U.S. Forest Service, among others. Jack's curriculum on nature journaling is now in its second edition. His books include An Introduction to the Ecology of San Francisco Estuary and The Comprehensive Field Guide to the Natural History of the Sierra Nevada, which is illustrated with 2,700 of his watercolors. He's now writing a similar guide to the natural history of the California Coast Range from Monterey to Mendocino. Awards that Jack has received include Wild Cares to Welder Environmental Education Award and National Audubon Society's Together Green Fellowship and, as a person with dyslexia, the Learning Disabled Achiever Award from the Lab School in Washington, D.C. Today, Jack will be speaking about nature journaling, phenomenological science, and creative thinking. Please join me in welcoming Tom Muir So, um, Thank you so much for um, letting me come and talk to your class. It's good to see you again, Lloyd. We've done a lot of fun uh, teaching things in the field together. Um, and I want to today share with you a, a lecture in two parts. Uh, the first is the way I think about science and how to best do that in the field, how to do that with students. Uh, actually, how to do it, period. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what science is. And, and, and uh, part of that's you know, due to the way which we were, we were taught it. Um, and then I want to take a deep dive into nature journaling and take a look at what I think is probably the single most powerful tool to develop good observers, creative thinkers, and uh, people who can use a scientific mindset to investigate what they see. Um, so we just first I want to start by just having us notice the way in which we observe. So what I'd like you to do is to look really, really hard at this bird. Look really hard. to look hard at something, probably some of the most useless instructions you can give to someone. <laughs> what does it mean to look hard at something? Are you supposed to like go, <laughs> I'm watching you, button. Right? Um, any birders in the room? Okay. Was, did anybody, was anybody able to identify that when you saw it? Yeah. So uh, probably a big handicap for people who are birders, because so what we're trained to do is go like, oh, Leslie Bunting, got it. And then we're on to the next thing. There's an interesting kind of switch that goes off in our human heads when we can identify something. That identification can stand in for really paying attention. We've got our kind of label for it, and we're on to the next thing. But a lot of what ends up being settling for environmental education um, has to do with can't, how many things can you identify. And then the labels can be really useful. Um, they can be a start of a conversation, but they really stand in for the thing. 
Um, I write field guides for part of my living, and I'm here to tell you that all of these drawings here are a lie. There's no bird that looks like anything like that. Well, there's some bird that's kind of like that. Well, it's kind of like that, kind of like that, kind of like that, kind of like that. But it turns out that every bunting out there is actually a unique individual. They are as different one from another as all the people in this room. And uh, when I did my master's thesis, I was studying these birds, and I found that even the ones you couldn't color band for identification purposes, you could tell those ones apart from, the, from, uh, from all the other birds by the morphological characteristics on their body. Can I be heard at the back of the room? This one's working. Thumbs up. Um, so, what uh, if you're trained to kind of spot it and identify it? And identify it this actually closes off a lot of your thinking. Um, because a bunting is not a bunting is not a bunting. Um, so what I want to do is to try to develop strategies to help me see past thinking, ah, it's a bunting, and see more with what is in front of me. And I've come up with a four-step process that I'm going to be sharing you in the first part of this workshop that is how I think about the sort of process of being a naturalist, of being a scientist in the field. And it starts with, with observation. So it starts with some phenomenon. And also, for thinking about teaching, this is a very useful approach, starting with some observable phenomenon. Sometimes people think, like, I want to teach about the water cycle, and then you kind of work backwards from it. What examples will I use? And you're kind of walking around, you know, what can I use in this place to teach about water cycle? What I think is a more useful way to go is to go into a place and find what really captures your attention, your interest, and we're going to be and build your curriculum from that starting point. Um, the next generation science standards really lend themselves nicely to this. Uh, once you've got a phenomenon that you're really curious about, there are all sorts of cross-cutting concepts that can tie into that in various ways. Um, but it starts with something that you really look at. But not everything that you look at will you actually perceive. Just because there's data in front of you doesn't mean that your brain is going to get it. Because what happens is this data from the phenomenon has to go through several filters. And at first, it has to kind of get into your sort of sphere of perception. And so we can only see a little limited part of the visible, visible spectrum. Um, we've got limitations in how well we can hear. Our smelling ability is absolutely terrible. Let me compare that with other beasties. So we've got limits on to how things can get in. But once things get in, then it gets chopped down even more because it has to go through the filter of our attention. And our ability to pay attention is really amazingly bad. Uh, we end up mind-wandering about 47% of the time. That means right now probably about 40% of the people, 47% of the people in this room are thinking about something other than what's happening right now. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, and so we're, we're off when we're thinking about other things. You're not applying, you can be staring at something. Like, sometimes you're like looking at this bird, I'm looking hard at this bird. Yeah, you told me to look hard at this bird, I'm looking hard at this bird, and you're thinking like, what am I supposed to be seeing? Am I going to be tested on this? Am I going to be some quiz? Well, I wonder if I'm going to get it. The minute you're thinking about those things, you're actually not thinking about the bird. That's my one. Um, another thing is just the capacity of our brain. All right? um, people who study <coughs> brains suggest that our brain can handle at one time, depending on how you kind of quantify these bits of information, about um, 110 bits of information. Uh, just following the track of a conversation takes about 60 bits of information. That's why you can't have a conversation and eavesdrop on somebody else at the same, same time. Right? Your bandwidth is maxed out. So our, our brains have a limited capacity. And also, your brain is just going to pay attention to the things that your brain decides are salient and important. So. Um, a lot of data that comes into your head, if your brain says, okay, that's not really a, uh, an important thing, it may be filtered out before it even rises to the level of your attention. Just to so, show us how uh, difficult it is to pay attention to something, this team, uh, teams of basketball players are going to help us observe what we observe and what we don't. Um, all you have to do is count how many times the team wearing white shirts passes the ball. 
right? Both teams are going to be passing balls. They're not going to be going super fast. You want to count how many times the team wearing the white shirts passes the ball. Everybody understand the instructions? We're going to be doing this silently to ourselves, so we're not going to make any noise to give anybody else any hints or clues about how many times they pass the ball. Are you ready? On your mark, get set, follow the white ball, uh, the white team. How'd you do? Uh, what'd you get? What'd you get? 14. 14, 16, 16. Hearing a lot of 16s. If it was a democracy, it would be 16. All right? So it's interesting. Uh, how many people didn't get 16? All right. So people were able to do a pretty good job on that. How many people saw the mountain gorilla? <laughs> All right, so more than half of us didn't see the mountain gorilla. Of you people who saw the mountain gorilla, how many of you people are going, this is the invisible gorilla test I've seen this before. This time, I'm going to get the gorilla. Right? So of those people who saw the gorilla, more than half of them knew the gorilla was coming. So question for you people who knew the gorilla was coming. It felt good when we saw the gorilla, didn't it? <laughs> Did you see the curtain change color? <laughs> Thinking this time I'm going to see the gorilla. All right? You missed the curtain change color? All right. Well, one one person back there saw it. All right. Let's let's just take a look at that again. Uh, this time you don't have to count. All right. Um, and what what happens is because the mountain gorilla was not salient to you. Right? Um, you thought you were supposed to pay attention to something else. There was a mountain gorilla and you missed the full grown mountain gorilla. <laughs> That's your attention. That's your attention. So we've got a limited bandwidth. And some stuff can be right in front of our face and we don't see it. Right? Um, for instance, count how many letter F's are in this sentence. <coughs> F's are up there. Got them? Pretty straightforward. You got them, right? How many of you saw those? <laughs> Isn't that weird? So they were invisible because they were behaving badly. They weren't going, <laughs> right? We all know F's go, and when they go, they're invisible. Even though the shape is in front of us, because they are bad, badly behaving apps, they were invisible to us. So just because something is in the sphere of our perception doesn't mean we're going to see it. Um, so your brain is doing a very, very kind of efficient calculation as you kind of plod through the world and you're kind of figuring out like, oh, I'm going to pay my attention over here, I'm going to pay attention over here. Um, there's stuff that your brain is leaving out even before you get to You are sketch noting. You rock. This kind of visual note taking is really, 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 really good. Everybody should look at their notes. <laughs> Do that. Isn't it fun? Yeah, it's good. The new pencil, they yeah. All right. Um, so we're going to go through this filter. I, I also. Um, so we're going to go through this filter of attention, and um, there are things that we can do to enhance our ability to uh, to notice the details that are in front of us. And one of those is verbalization. So the idea of verbalization is just as you're looking at something, you're going to say out loud whatever it is that you're saying. All right? I'm seeing a gentleman. He's got one foot uh, bent, the other one straight. He's got blue lace-up shoes. He's also wearing a matching blue hat, checkered white shirt, tan pants. Are those corduroys? No. Um, and so I'm just uh, so close cropped beard. And he's just scratched behind his head. Um, now he's feeling uncomfortable with the attention. So um, what I'm doing is just making a stream of consciousness riff of observations. This technique is actually taught to uh, police investigators and uh, beat patrolmen. When they see something odd going on, they're trained to start verbalizing what they see. 
And what this does is a human memory is terrible. And you're gonna have to you're gonna have to answer to your kind of body cam when you write your report. And it turns out that people are much, much more accurate if they start verbalizing their observations. And so your report and your body cam might match, and that is, is a good thing. Um, other things that really help is being in a dynamic conversation with somebody. If you are engaged in the conversation with something about something that you're looking at, your memory of that is going to be better. Intentionally looking at different scales of focus, either zooming in close or something, or backing up and getting the big picture uh, makes a big difference. And doing a joint comparison of two different things at the same time actually helps you look at each one of those individually. If you're trying to say, you know, is this school a good deal? Should I, uh, should I go to this, this school? It's hard to make any decision. The minute you're actually comparing two schools against each other at the same time, the differences and the qualities of each are much more apparent. That's called a joint comparison. And it's a strategy that you can use not just for schools, but for observing anything in the natural world. Um, and what I think is the most important is journaling. Uh, we'll be talking the whole, the, the second part of this, we'll be really doing a deep dive on journaling. Journaling is a very powerful way to get your brain to see layers and layers and layers of depth and beauty. Um, so here we are having a conversation with people out in nature. Um, the, uh, here I am looking at some birds out on a little point of land. And it's kind of interesting, sort of the spacing of these birds from another, they're kind of dense and close together, a bunch of different species. When I zoom out and look at the entire spit, all those birds are concentrated down at one end. When you're zoomed in here, that's not a detail that you really notice. So intentionally zooming out or zooming in as part of your practice is a very, very powerful um, thing to do. And here we have a joint comparison. Notice if you were describing the shape of a leaflet and you didn't have that to compare it to, it would just like, oh yeah, it's, 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 it's a leaflet. Um, but when you can compare this leaf base with this leaf base, the, this all of a sudden becomes a distinctive thing that you can notice as a difference. And that really happens when you start to do a joint comparison, two things at the same time. So take a look at these and notice, can you pick out a couple other things that you can notice that are sort of more in your face when you're looking at two at the same time. What else do you notice? Yeah? Where the leaves join the stem, on the right they all join at the same place, and on the left they join at the same place. Great. Great. What else? I've been trained to be comfortable in that pregnant pause in the class. <laughs> right? You're going to have to get used to it too. You drop a question out there, and it's like silence, and you're like, okay, I better say something else. I've got to fill that dead air space. No, just resist it, resist it, resist it. Right? Yeah, so, joint comparison, very, very powerful tool. Let's just try this verbalization um, at our, ourselves. What I'd like you to do is take a look at this, Robin, and in just a moment, you're going to start saying your observations out loud. Just stream of consciousness, riff of observation. Got to give you a warning. At one point, you're going to mind wander, and mind wandering looks like this. All right, All right. Auntie's got a water bottle. There's a little tag on it. It's kind of an orange water bottle, and he broke the little um, connector. The connector is sort of a different color of gray than the rest of the water bottle. And um, and uh, so when you mind wander, all of a sudden the riff of observation stops. It's like, my observation well just dried up. And thinking like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I say anything? And you're mind wandering. You're thinking about, why can't I say anything else about this? All right? So you just go, oh, cool, mind wandering. No big deal. I'm just going to bring myself back to this. All right? And start saying your observations again. All right? So we're going to try this out loud, just in regular conversational voice. Your observations about this well. And, uh, out loud. <laughs>
these numbers are in a specific sequence and order. One of these numbers comes next in that sequence. Which one of these numbers comes next in this order? The mathematicians in the room won't get it. Raise your paw if you think you know. Here's a hint. At first it looks like a lousy hint, but it's actually a really, really good hint. You, you want to me? Don't say that. Never call on the first person that raises their hand. What's going on here? So just like F's are not supposed to go V, numbers are not supposed to be in alphabetical order. Nicely done. Um, but this activity took your full attention. Even with this distraction, notice that any details that you said out loud about that Robin are still with you right now. If you said it out loud, kind of do a little mental inventory of all the things you noticed. Compare that to the bird you're looking really, really hard at. Isn't that interesting? So that verbalization technique, easy to teach to kids, easy to teach to adults, absolute money for observation. Absolute money for observation. Um, did anybody notice a detail about that robin that you had never noticed about a robin before? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven people in this room noticed something about that robin that they had never noticed about a robin before. Here's the interesting thing. You've been looking at robins your entire life. And here is a short video. And you saw something new about that robin. It's not that there's anything special about this video. It was that you were paying attention to it in a totally different way. It's that attention that is the doorway to those sort of discoveries. But the way which we normally and just very practically observe doesn't let that stuff in. So this is the first part of this, 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 this system. Oh, is this the same Robin? No. How do you know? There was, there was a sharper um, piece of eye ring, a much stronger triangle toward the beak of eye ring on the other one. Great. Anything else? Yeah. The top of its beak was a different color. Yeah. So you've just identified a Robin as an individual. Hold on. Um, I've challenged myself every time I see that same video to notice something that I have never noticed before about that robin. So far, including today, I've been successful every time. If you force yourself to pay attention, there are levels and levels of wonder in front of you, details in front of you that you can mine. But most of us stop at American Robin. So that is uh, what. Uh, Oh, and so, so it's interesting, the last filter here is the filter of memory. So things have to go through our filter of memory. So they come in through their senses, through our attention, through our filter of memory. It's uh, the same part of your brain that is involved in attention is also involved in memory. So these things that you do right here to get yourself to pay attention also lock this stuff into your memory. This is the first part of this process that I call I notice. So it starts with I notice, and now things are going to get even more interesting. Because you have all sorts of prior experience about some phenomenon that you're looking at. There are robins that you've seen before. Right? You might have seen David Attenborough's Life, uh, 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 World of Birds, and, and he was talking about robins. Or um, you, um, when you were a little kid, a robin hit your window. There are all sorts of experiences that you have that in one way will remind you of this phenomenon of looking at the robin. And what you want to do is go up into that constellation of it reminds me of us and also verbalize those. So anything that you've seen that this in one way reminds you of, you're going to also say that. Because all this stuff should be on the playing table. So the it reminds me of us. That would be your cue. There we go. 
Um, it reminds me of, this can be you know, something you saw on TV. It can be as playful or as scientific as you want to make it, right? So as your personality, the sort of things that kind of like, you know, that reminds me of Jabba the Hutt, right? Or can we say, that reminds me of the Phylum Cordata, or what, you know? <laughs> it's going to be different for depending on what your sort of background and proclivities are. I'm about to show you another video, and what I'd like you to do is this time, you're going to say out loud your I notices, and also your it reminds me of. Right? And to make this more fun, you're going to lean in near other people so you can eavesdrop on their I notices, <laughs> Poach their I notices and see if that sort of stimulates you into a different I notice, all right? And sort of see, you know, are there, you know, and, and kind of riff off their it reminds me of. See how much you can kind of get going with that. Are you ready? On your mark. So lean in. Hey, you guys know each other's names? Maybe. No, no, it's an embarrassing thing because they, they, you're sitting next to this person, you've forgotten their name. Pretend the person next to you doesn't know your name, and right now just reintroduce yourself. Right now, even if they already know your name. Have you guys already done that? All right, so ready? You guys ready? Then we're going to do I notices with the bonus factor of it reminds me of. Are you ready? Here we go. Oh, this is what uh, we're not going to actually do it on this. This is just to remind me that I was going to. That part of what is kind of neat here, what makes this this fun, is that the 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 when you connect it reminds me of with um, a lot of other things that uh, or where you connect uh, an observation to a lot of it reminds me of that event has a better chance of staying in your memory. So those which are networked to other sorts of ideas and thoughts, those are going to be little data points that stick with you. And one interesting definition of curiosity, um, uh, or sorry, of creativity, is a person's ability to connect as many things, different things, as, as, as they can. So you're intentionally networking these, these, these observations. Um, and when you make it, it reminds me of, it could be just playful, like, it's Jabba the Hutt. Or it could be that there's actually some mechanism going on behind the scenes that actually is the same, so it's a similar process. So uh, you put your cookies too close together, and they come out making a little honeycomb pattern. Mm -hmm. Oh, it kind of reminds me of a bee honeycomb. Well, it could just be like, yeah, that's kind of, that's neat. So the interesting similarity, there could be an interesting process behind that same phenomenon, driving it. And so and actually, that is what's going on here. These cookies, as they expand, they expand evenly into all the other cookies. And in the honeycomb, these aren't making little hexagons. They're making, they're sort of making little circular wells, and as they're putting those in, they're pushing their little bee heads against the sides. And there's another bee on the other side doing that, and these little circles expand into each other, making the honeycomb. So they're actually not out there with their little bee protractors. 120 degree angle, okay, I got it. Right? Um, so when I'm taking notes, I'll do the same thing. You know, so this little pod here reminds me of those little shuttles in Star Wars, right? So, so it, um, a, 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 a 3D Escher drawing of a flower, um, a, a, a bean pod with an extra seam, right? So you want to kind of let your imagination go and mess with that. Are you ready? Go. <laughs> Students just sit at their desks 
doing an activity by themselves? A lot. Because it's what you're supposed to do. We're social primates, y'all. And we love doing this. Actually, I was uh, spent part of the time trying to do this exercise, and then I was looking down at rows to see who was smiling. And you guys are doing a ton of smiling. There's a bunch going on here, here. Even you guys, right? Tom going back in this cluster back here. You guys are cracking each other up. Same way down here. You ended up doing a lot of this kind of solo, and you weren't smiling as much as everybody else. But I don't think it's because you're a sad person. But it's the impact of actually doing this with other people. So, um, you know, so did uh, uh, any interesting it reminds me of pop up for folks? Yeah, well, yeah, well you gotta tell us. You gotta tell us. Uh, this one frog video online where the frog like squeals and like walks backwards, and it kind of reminds me. <laughs> any others? Rubber ducky. Rubber ducky. <laughs> yeah, what was yours? Jimmy Durante was the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> There's three people in here who know that. <laughs> All right. So this is this is a very powerful strategy. You want to intentionally network and experience with what the rest of the fabric of your experiences are, on purpose. Sometimes it reminds me of well, just like oh that's weird. That reminds me of something. Right? But if you actually intentionally go there, like this reminds me of. Something's going to come. And when it does, you're going to write it down in your journal or you're going to say it out loud to your friends. Right? Uh, so there is, it reminds me of, here's I notice, these are your two big buckets of inspiration for stimulating questions. The goal of these things is to get you to ask interesting questions specifically about the observations you're making about this phenomenon and connecting that with what you already know. This is really different than the lines of questionings that kids give you when like, you're supposed to know certain science facts about things like the brontosaurus weighs, you know, like everybody knows the weight of dinosaurs, <laughs> right? The length of dinosaurs, as if this is like important to dinosaur biology, like you weigh, right? who cares? The kids are smoking, like, they, they, they get these little fact cards about the cheetah. It's always like how fast it is, and they always have like how old it, how old they live. And so kids, when you're asking them a question about an animal, they'll be like, like I got to ask a question. Okay, um, how old do they live? Right? Right? These are like these questions are things that they think we think we're supposed to know the science facts, these memorizable lists of things. But what you want to do is forget the memorizable list of things. We want to come up with questions that no one has ever asked before, or that you've never asked before. Take your brain places that it doesn't normally go. So you're going to intentionally let these things stimulate questions. The little who, there's a couple of heuristics that I find very helpful to do this. So the, the one that everybody knows is who, what, where, when, how, why. Right? So the, the thing that they teach all the people in journalism school. Right? That's a very kind of useful thing. You're kind of looking at, you know, like, so the, the, the who is more of an identification thing. Um, things like uh, when, these are things with timing. Right? You know, what time of night was that thing filmed? Was that at night? When, you know, so you're asking a when question. The, often the further you go down on a list like this, the more difficult the questions get to ask, to, to answer. Right? And um, you actually end up needing different strategies for, for some of those, those, those questions. But they're, they're very, very rich, interesting things. Here's another heuristic. Um, that I've recently started uh, tinkering with. I was in, in, checking out the school's possibilities for my little daughter, and I went into this international school, and in every classroom they had this list of prompts on the wall for questioning strategies. And I was going, oh my god, these are absolutely brilliant, high percentage things. So I wrote them down here. So the first is form function, right? So form, um, you're thinking about, you know, um, how is it shaped? Function is, is, is what is that for? Causation is looking at, you know, how did it get that way? How is it affecting other sorts of things? Change, what was it before? What will it be next? Connection, self-explanatory. Perspective was weird. So perspective was a neat thing that they had on this list. Under perspective, they were thinking about things like, um, well, what are the different points of, of, of view on this, right? Really useful for kind of, uh, especially for sort of social sorts of things. 
right? Because we have a tendency to believe what we believe. Intentionally kind of getting yourself to look at other points of view is great. Reflection is, why do I know this? What's my evidence? There's a whole bunch of the uh, next generation science standards is getting kids to make explanations from evidence, right? And they're actually dealing with that in their reflection thing. So what's my, my evidence for that? And my responsibility is like, what's my personal responsibility for this? Like, what, how do I, how am I part of this system? Um, really great questions to ask. So I've now started writing this list in the back of my journal. Kind of to prompt me to ask some of these sorts of questions as well. So these are examples of heuristics that can help you generate questions if they don't naturally come to you. And so what are you going to do when you've got a question? So, yeah, we just saw that other one. So, <laughs> so one thing you can do is to look it up, right? Everybody gets out their phone, you're like, oh, how much does that weigh? like, well, the brontosaurus weighs. Hey, did you know the brontosaurus is back? Did you, did you hear that news? They took, brontosaurus was no longer, it was it turned out to be a mistake. And it turns out they brought, the more recent studies, we brought brontosaurus back. That's a different kind of story, but you can look that up on your phone, like, what is the brontosaurus back? Is the brontosaurus back? Here's the information. So you can look that up on your phone. Right, but you're going to very quickly, if you're asking interesting questions, you're going to ask questions that no one has asked before. And it's not on Google. Right? Another thing you have to, what are some uh, dangers of the look it up approach? You get one answer, and usually that answer is the one you're looking for. Right? So if you've got an idea, what you think you know what's going on, you are going to filter information. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? This is called confirmation bias. Right? We're going to ignore all this because we think that, and we see one example of it, and that gives us our answer. Right? So when you're looking something up, you've got to be careful with that. Another thing is that there is now a whole bunch of information out there. And it's not just getting information. We now have to do a lot of information sifting because there's a ton of stuff, a large percentage of stuff that is just incorrect online. So here's, here's a kind of a, a different a sort of example of kind of how we have games we can play with ourselves. I have an idea in my head, a, a, a mathematical rule that I use to generate this sequence of numbers, okay? Take a look at the sequence of numbers and see if you can come up with another sequence of numbers that also follows my rule. Right. And does anybody have a number, an idea for another series? Yes, sir. Three, six, nine. Three, six, nine. He's correct. What's another? Four eight twelve. Yes. How many people think they know what my rule is? Okay. Um, so what's a, what's another sequence? Seven nine eleven. Seven nine eleven. Yes. Give me another. One, two, three. Yes. One, two, three. Two, four, five. Two, four, five. Yes. <laughs> How many people think they know what my rule is? do when we think we know something is we will ask questions that fit the way of the pattern we think it should be. What people tend not to do is to suggest a sequence of numbers that would test their idea. And that's an example of confirmation bias. So if we have an idea of what this sequence is, we'll often kind of go like, whoa, 11, 12, 13. Right? So, in all, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll say something that we think should work, and if it does, we go, 
yeah, I got it. But that's different than actually what what would be what would be a what would be a different approach? Ten and nine eight. So what you've just done is if you think it's your pattern is you're just going up, which is actually what my sequence is, is say something that breaks that rule. Right? You're actually testing your idea. That's a very, very powerful way to start thinking. So you're the, they're the first one that if you're thinking like, okay, they start going up, they're first going up by twos, but no, they're not going up by twos, they seem just to be going up, right? You're saying something that's going in the opposite direction, that doesn't fit the pattern. And what we're used to is like, yes, that's good, that fits my pattern, right? But you're actually not testing anything when you're doing that. You're just asking for more confirmation. But by actually asking ones where the, the teacher says, no, that doesn't work. Right? That's not, oh shucks, I got it wrong. You're like, yes! Right? Now I've got something that I can work with. Right? So that's kind of messing with confirmation bias in our own heads. And also, lastly, just sort of don't assume that uh, everything that you read is true, because there's, there's, there's an awful lot of, of just sort of uh, misinformation out there. And you, you try hard enough, you can find some information that will agree with any screwball notion that you have. So you have to be really careful with that confirmation by itself. And this also is true when we get to uh, sort of data. Um, it turns out that lots of stuff that you find even in peer-reviewed studies, you know, you go back, you try to get a replication of that, you can't, you kind of get in there and you dig into the data. There are goofs that were made. And so you have to be skeptical about how you are analyzing information that you get when you're looking stuff up, and you also have to be willing to change your mind. So that's the look it up business. So not just as simple as, yeah, I got it on Google, right? And it's also something that we have to really teach our kids. Because they're going to get, oh, if there's that answer that I got on Google. If people have the, the framework in their head of confirmation bias, and I'm expecting to kind of get a warm, mushy feeling when I see something that agrees with my worldview, right, and realize that that is a danger sign, that is really, really helpful. So what's another thing we can do? I've got a question about some phenomenon in nature. Can't find it on the web. I can go look at the real thing. Whoops. Oh, this is where I was going to read that slide. So I can go actually look at the real thing. This is just making an observation. I hear a cool bird singing out there. I go, I wonder what bird is making that song. I can get up my binoculars. I can walk out there. I can see the bird. I can hear the music coming out of its mouth. I can see the beak open. I can look at it with my binoculars. I can get out to the little field guy. Go, okay, I can figure it out what bird is making that noise. Right? So some questions there will be a direct observation that answers your question. This is great. So things like who, sometimes a what question, a how, sort of a when question. What time do those birds uh, arrive, start arriving in the pond, right? I just start sitting by the pond with my notebook and look over a bunch of days in different sorts of weather and I start to get more and more information. I can answer those sorts of questions for by direct observation. But there's one other category that is really interesting. Oh, so here's some direct observation stuff, right? Um, so here's an example of direct observation. Uh, I'm looking at some acorn woodpeckers, and I'm going, um, are their eyes closed when pecking? And I look at it through my binoculars, and I go, no, they're not. And then I look even closer, and I go, yes, if the chips are flying. So I just sort of changed my mind there and wrote that down. <laughs> right? And then I disagreed myself with myself because I, I, I got out a spotting scope and I started looking at these woodpeckers. And I went, no, it's this little inner eyelid that seems to be coming down. And then I noticed that sometimes it didn't seem to be coming down. So I went, well, and I went, sometimes. So you know, here I'm trying to figure stuff out by direct observation. And something like, are the eyes closed when pecking? You can actually answer by staring at some woodpeckers. And then notice that there are these cool little holes in the tree, right? And uh, that's where the acorns stash their little, uh, the acorn woodpeckers stash their acorns. But the bottom part of the tree did not have acorns stashed. 
So I thought to myself, is this is this a regular pattern? You know, how low do acorn woodpeckers cache acorns on granary trees? This is a question I can't answer from direct observation. Right? And so I start measuring those things, and it's somewhere around four or five feet. So sometimes you can do direct observation and you answer your question. That's pretty cool. But what I can't answer is why they're doing that. So a why question cannot be directly observed. And this is where you get start to have science fun. Because um, some things I might be able to infer. And this is this wonderful area of could it be. And I think this is probably one of the more, the least understood kind of corners of science process. This idea of could it be. But this is where things get really, really interesting. And the reason that it's, where there's a lot of confusion about it, is because we have all been indoctrinated with this. The scientific method. How many people learned the scientific method in school? Right? There's a sort of, you're going you're gonna to do this, you're going 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 to do this. Right? There's, you look around different classrooms, there's different forms of it that you find in different places, often with cool graphics. Right? But they, they all are kind of, you, you are, you are kind of saying that you're going to, you got your question, and then over here, you are going to come out with, you're going to draw your conclusions, um, and then you accept and, and re or refine or reject your, your hypothesis. This is missing a, well, several things. Um, how long has this system of exploration been around? How long has this been the scientific method? 500 years. About 500 years? Alright. Does that sound about right? Maybe, maybe even earlier, like Aristotle, something like that. This might go back to Aristotle. So why am I dissing it if Aristotle started this? <laughs> Turns out this scientific method started in the 1940s, 1945. And what happened is Kessler sort of sent around a, a, a survey to a bunch of, of scientists that people kind of write in, these are things that scientists do, and then had some scientists look at it and said, yes, these are sorts of things that scientists do. Kessler took that list and put some of them that went into a nice, sweet, little, neat narrative, put them in order, and said this is the scientific method. And this got picked up on by scientific textbooks in the 40s. And it's been with us as the, the scientific method. There are lots of scientific methods. Could you do that approach? Sure. But a lot of science is sort of mucking about, tinkering with things. And even that, the scientific method, leaves out where sort of the bigger picture of what's going on. So what I like is, a, is, a, is, a, is looking at this could it be process in a slightly different way. So um, what I do when I'm thinking about a could it be question is I try to come up with as many different possible explanations, reasonable possible explanations, as I can. Most of my, the, the, the highest, and I've got a bunch of personal experience behind me. The ones that seem the most plausible to me, I'm probably going to initially be the most interested in. I want to spend most of my time in kind of those high percentage areas of things that seem plausible, but I also want to take part of my brain capacity, maybe 90, 10, percent, it depends, different percents might, depending on, on how kind of X-files you are, you know, you want to leave a little bit of room in your head for some really out there explanations, right? But you want to spend most of your time kind of on those things, you're going to be sort of higher percentage. Right? So here are four different possible possibilities. Well, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. So what I want to do is also have one other category there, and that is the very important box of what I have not yet thought of. And that's always on this differential diagnosis. There are all these possible explanations, or it could be something else that I just haven't thought of yet. And that, that possibility is always out there. So back to this, I now know how high they go, but I don't know why. So I can come up with some possibilities of, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. 
some possibilities of why that could be. I can do all this on my piece of paper. So we're going to try this now. I'm going to show you a video. And what I'd like you to do is, while you're looking at it, socially with people kind of lean in, do I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, and could it be, now, I, I find it's hard to force the um, I wonders, and it's hard to force the could it be's. But, so what I do is just sort of a, a riff of, of I notice and that reminds me of. When you're in, in doubt, just kind of go back to more I notices. But see if any kind of, well, I wonder why, why is this happening? You really, when those questions kind of fly by, reach out and grab one of those questions. All right? And especially if you're doing this in a little group, somebody asks an interesting question, just throw out a couple could it be's with that. Well, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. Not in definite language, well, it's doing this to do this, but in a tentative language, well, it could be because of blah, blah, blah. Are you ready? On your mark. Get set. This time he's going to get back and kind of get in a social group. Right? That's what that's about, right? Okay, are you ready? Here we go. Same 
is it could they be using a, a similar mechanism as, as fish? Uh, so these things, these these ideas are linked. The I notices, the could it be the I wonders, reminds me of. There's a system here, and what you want to do is just start to be more intentional about sort of following the system. So we're going to start here, have it lead to that. Maybe you can look it up, maybe, and not necessarily trust what you find. Maybe you can observe it, but if you can't, then that's when you're in the could it be area. Um, how the uh, sort of idea of you need a hypothesis, you're going to be testing some hypothesis. There's no hypothesis necessary here. Right? So, but up here, every alternate explanation, that's what a hypothesis is. So that's where that idea sort of fits in. And then what happens is each one of these ideas, there are, if that's true, there are, then I should expect to see this and this and this and this. For each one of those explanations, there are testable, observable predictions. And what I want to do is just kind of go along and say, well, if that's true, I'd expect to see this and this and this and this. If my assumptions about what's going on here are correct. If my assumptions are wrong, I might think that something is a testable prediction that's really not. So this is kind of where you get your wiggle room. This is the wiggle room caveat. But um, for all of these, I want to try to generate as many testable predictions as I can think of. Again, that if my assumptions are wrong, I might come up with some predictions that really, really, uh, that, that, that aren't right. And maybe there's, there's one, and I can't, there's, I've got a, a possible explanation, but at this point, I can't think of any way to test it. I'm just going to put it on the shelf for now. Right? It just sits on the shelf. And then what I can do is I can compare my, my, my predictions against what I actually see. I say, I expect to see this. Do I go out there and I, and I see it? And no, I don't. Right? So on this one, I look for that, and I go like, ah, that's really not what I saw. Huh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, let's try another one. Sometimes you can come up with one test that will be true. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's true, it's going to support one. If it's going to be, if it's false, it will support the, uh, another. So sometimes one test can simultaneously um, uh, give you uh, test a couple of different hypotheses. So let's say this one here, nope, but it does sort of support this idea. So I can then go and start to explore these. Interesting. Um, I then have another um, set of testable predictions here. And I start testing those. Like, Ooh, that's interesting. When I get a case like this, does it mean that it's definitely not this? Okay, why not? Right? So there, there might, I might have done a test in the wrong way. Absolutely. Um, or some of my assumptions could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Does this mean it's definitely this? I'm seeing a lot of head shaking, but nobody's saying no. It's a safer to do that. <laughs> Alright, so, um, but, but if I'm seeing this pattern, what I've got here is something, this explanation ends up being really <laughs> predictive, and that's useful. I can then come up with, if then, like, man, if, if all these things, when I, I, I check it, it shows them. I can continue to expand that list. The more that I test that, the more I'm going to be saying, you know, I really like that idea. That seems to be really, really holding true. And if I really, really like it, and I throw everything I can against it, and I can't crack that one, it keeps being predictive, does that mean it's true? How many people say yes? Good, no hands, right? <laughs> right. So it, it's 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 my it's it is it, it's my best guess so far. And here's the powerful expo, uh, expression. I'm going to if something is really predictive, I can grant it provisional acceptance. And that means until <coughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use this as a useful tool until I can um, can crack it. So evolution is a great example of this. Okay. Um, gravitation. Right. I've got uh, my understanding of the way gravity works. We can get astronauts to the moon 
and back, that's pretty crazy with even uh, an early understanding of gravitation. All right? Now we're getting, but you know, then you start kind of getting to little areas where like, you start seeing consistency, so you kind of tweak it, you modify things. But our current understanding of it, you know, we can get satellites, kind of slingshot them around the moon and out into space and do all sorts of crazy things. It doesn't mean we're right, but it means until we get some other evidence, that's a really useful idea. So what I'm trying to do is get uh, naturalists to get people to be aware of the, their own personal epistemology. Why do I think what I think? What is my evidence for that? To be checking my sources, why do I think what I think? And that's what this is all about. We start with a phenomenon. We teach kids how to really generate observations creatively. We teach them how to kind of go into their data bank of what they sort of the previous experience with this is. Use that to generate questions and use that to sort of find explanations. And that is a very, very powerful and kind of useful framework for exploring the world. So before we do a deep dive on journaling here, I would like to turn to you folks and to um, ask if there, so I'm going to ask everybody to sort of take one minute and just write down on a piece of paper your own personal thoughts, comments, or observations about what we've been discussing here. So just, just it can be in bullet point form, it could be in paragraph form, but just on your own piece of paper, kind of, I'm going to ask you to think about what we've been, what I've been uh, explaining here, and, um, and, and see what your kind of own sort of personal thoughts or reflections on that are. Any thoughts, comments, ideas, or observations? Raise your hand if you want a little bit more time. or observations or questions sir well I had a thought I almost always have a pen so I can write it down but um, I think that um, generally I like I like your scheme quite a bit but the part in which you were mentioning the police and noticing everything uh, I don't know if you're aware of it but there's some a lot of research that suggests that by verbalizing sometimes you actually uh, reduce your capacity verbal overshadow exactly later so you know, I imagine that all other things being equal, you know, if you're not going to be an eyewitness testimony person, it's probably a good idea to write all those things down. But I wonder, I mean, conceivably, that even hurts your ability to, like, recognize the bird later. Yeah. When, when, when I uh, first read that research, um, it terrified me. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. This, 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 is, this is... So I called up the researcher. Uh -huh. And you, see, you pointed out to me the difference in what I'm doing here and what, with what, what they're testing is with verbal overshadow is where um, after the observation you get after the observations are made you have somebody say things about it and then what happens is the things that you say that's so salient because of the process of, of involvement the same things that kind of stuck the thing into your memory when you were observing it if you're you know a few steps removed from being there your memory isn't good. So much of our, our memory is stuff that we completely fabricate. And if we say it out loud at that point, then whatever we've said, 
will completely overshadow what real observations were then. So, so it's the retrospective aspect. Exactly. You're not doing it in the moment, but you're exactly. a little later, I think. So the research on verbal overshadowing is retrospectively saying things out loud to help you remember, realizing that those can overshadow the what your real experience of tasting that wine was. And um, so that's, that's so that the, this is, it's not really an example. Uh, at first I was thinking like, oh my god, this, my, my, my verbalization paradigm is just pretend, but, but actually it's, it's, a, it's a different sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Other questions or thoughts? Yes. For folks familiar with the NGSS, this is the ask of the NGSS. Right, so some of your references were to, to um, previous teaching styles or, or previous standards, 1998 standards. This is the ask of the NGSS to, to, to shift how students look at science, do science, what they're able to do at the end of the day, not just know. So this fits wonderfully with what we're asking teachers to be able to do with our kids in our classrooms. Great. And do you want to introduce yourself? Because this the comment comes from somebody with credentials. So I, I'm Jim, I work on the um, state NGSS committee, and I do a lot of work around the country with NGSS stuff. So um, we met before, uh, but uh, just the notion of, of all this stuff isn't like an option of what we maybe want to try to do for a unit. This is really the ask of how we kind of create our instructional classrooms, I think, going forward. So um, this is great. Thank you so much. This is this is kind of me nervous to have the guy in the room because <laughs> this guy knows his NGSS. All right, so let's take a look at this um, nature journaling bit for a little bit because I believe that nature journaling will completely change the way you do your science. And if you've got a, a classroom of kids and you start um, you start um, observational notebooks at the beginning of the class and you continue them all the way through, you're going to radically change kids' brains the way that they think. The way that they're usually used, I think, is just playing in the shallow end of the pool, right? And I think that they are so much richer, and really, in, really interesting things that you can can do in them. And so I want to kind of uh, make a pitch for that. So this is uh, an experience that I had. Um, I was out at a pond, and I was observing ducks, and I was sketching them. You notice that I'm changing sizes here. Um, I've 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 got. Um, I've got a lot of um, you know, observations. At one point I decided like, I'm going to try to name the different parts of these birds. The ducks are moving around. I'm making different views of them. So I'm, I'm visually learning and also kind of incorporating some written notes with that. And something that I figured out while I was doing that is that I had no idea what this little dark spot was right here, morphologically on the side of this duck, which for me is kind of a, a, a it's very esoteric point. But because I'm a bird nerd, I was like, well, what? I mean, okay, these are the scapular feathers. What's, what's that? What is that called? And I couldn't figure it out. So this idea was sort of poking me. And I was kind of, that bothered me. I didn't know what was going on. Um, but then the next time I went out to that pond, I found a dead duck of that species. I'm like, score! Because now I can like, go through its feathers and get my question answered. So we talked before about salience. This was salient to me because I wondered about it. Now I see dead duck, dead pintail. All right, so I start going through these, these, these feathers, and that's this little patch right up here, and I discover that there's even an exclamation point, the black spot mystery. It's the scapulars, the lower scapulars, and I was so <laughs> excited. Here's details for those who want to see that the scapula actually partly down has this, it turns black, and, and that's why it's making this sort of crisply edged dark spot, and that, I thought, was just really neat. But then, you know, this gets me looking at a dead duck, right? Here, I'm now sort of making a collection of feathers, and I'm messing around a lot with this dead duck, so I've now got a dead duck on the brain. And so I start looking around, and I realize that there are a lot of dead ducks in this pond. <sighs> <laughs> Alright, so, um, that's expression has to. Um, so, so here, I started counting around the pond. I went from, I'm gonna draw pictures to now I'm like, I'm getting quantitative. And I'm going around and I'm counting how many, I get 38 total dead ducks in this pond. Wow, right? Now that's, that's pretty crazy. 
And so that leads me to the question of, that's, that's a lot of dead ducks, what's happening here? And I start coming up with alternative, alternative explanations. So out there in the field, in my notes, I am kind of saying, well, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. And look at this category here, what am I not thinking of? Right? And here were some kind of clues to things that kind of didn't make sense to me, that these might be significant and I, and I didn't know. So this was really interesting. It turns out, a couple days later, this uh, went from being 38 dead ducks to over 100. And uh, fish and game people came in there, and they ended up having a, an outbreak of uh, avian cholera in this pond. And they, uh, fish and game drained it and kept it dry for, um, tried to keep it dry for a year, and um, ducks are now coming back there. It was, we're out there with the Nature Journal Club. Remember that? Was the, that was the, we were like at the, we were, we were like there with patient zero. <laughs> <laughs> right? And the only reason I remember it is because I journaled. And you remember it because you journaled it, right? I mean, I was there journaling, yeah. not journaling the same thing, but there remembering because I was yeah. So um, here's a nature journaler. So she's regularly doing this. Massive impact on her ability to remember experiences in detail. All right? This is kind of the, this is a really, really rich process. But there's a lot of interesting things that are going on here. Um, and so what I want to do is to explore how to get kids to do this. Oh, here's some, some other kind of questions that I had about this, and I'm just thinking about part of this mystery. Um, so here is, just uh, pause for a second. I should say that this Leonardo da Vinci quote is attributed to Leonardo. But I haven't yet found the direct place that it comes from. <coughs> All right, so this is where I want to get kids. All right, I want to learn to see. I'm going to try. I'm going to make a pitch for using the journal to do this. All right, so here you are, and uh, this is your, your your brain. Turns out when we are thinking about things and it's all going on inside here, our capacity for dealing with really complex things is very very limited. Um, how many people um, know somebody? You don't have to raise your hand if it was you, right? But either you or somebody else um, um, was struggling with the problem and they went and did talk therapy. Anybody know somebody? All right? But as you get older, all your friends will be doing it. Right? <laughs> um, or you've had a problem that you were struggling with, and you found, sat, sat down with a friend and you just sort of talked about it. You felt so much better when you got it off your chest and you kind of came up with some good strategies for how to deal with it. All right? You aired it out. Well, it turns out that when you're just dealing with it all inside your head, the capacity of our brain to deal with all sorts of little discrete bits of information is very, very limited. And so what happens is a bunch of ideas either just float through your head, right? You don't have the processing capacity for it, or they bounce off your armor. Or sometimes when you're thinking, you think you're thinking about something, what you're really doing is just ruminating. You're taking the same idea and kind of going, like, hey, Have you ever had a friend kind of getting over a breakup and they're kind of thinking about it? They're just sort of playing the same tape again and again and again and again and again and again and again, and again not productive. Right? Sometimes when we think we're really thinking about something, we're just running that same tape again. And we're not aware that we're doing it. Another thing we do is just mind wandering. 47% of the time. That's 40% of the people in this room right now. Right? So um, that's our kind of brain's go-to place. The solution is to externalize your thinking. And what you want to do is either by talking or by journaling, Get it out of your head and out into the air, right? So saying your observations or writing your observations down, this is going from inside here to now it's, you start to kind of get it out there and really interesting things start to happen. I'm finding that the journaling is even more effective for a number of reasons than, than the talking. So here's the, the impact of doing this. Um, so what, so, so let's think about, you've got ideas, you're kind of getting them out on paper. How is this going to help you? What is this going to do? What are reasons that you might think, if you're trying to make a case for, uh, reasons for externalizing your thinking, what's that going to do to help you? Helps you notice patterns. Helps you notice patterns. Right, so say a little bit more about that. I really like what you're saying. Um, so this is a little personal, but I remember, like, 
I was dealing with a breakup and I started writing things down and I realized I was just writing the same thing over and over again. And so, I mean, it was good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes, so what else? Yes? You can see if you're changing your memories. So like if you wrote something down, you know, a year ago, and then you sort of have this tendency to remember it differently, you can go back and read one say, oh, this actually happened in a very different way than I originally. When you're ruminating, you have a tendency to change facts. Yeah. How many people have a memory of something that happened in their childhood that you remember vividly? Newsflash, it's a lie. <laughs> right? So what, what happens is that um, your brain takes a snippet of what actually happened and the rest is forgotten. Your brain what does what's called confabulation, which is inserting into this all sorts of other um, rich details to present to you a beautiful, rich, clear memory. Part of that's what happened. The rest is stuff that you completely made up and your brain has no way to tell what's what. So that permanent record is really powerful. People know about the Challenger study? So the Challenger study, after the Challenger disaster, the, they took a bunch of the engineers who were involved with that and they had them say, just tell us about your experience, what you're doing, how you heard about it, and all these sorts of things that people wrote about. These are people who really were paying attention to them, they were really affected by it. And, you know, I remember ex clearly, ex I was doing this, and then this, and then this, and then this happened, and this happened. And then I went, we went to the bar, and we went with these people, and we just sort of hung around, and it was completely silent. You know, all people would describe in detail what happened. And then they did a, a follow-up a few years later. And then a few years after that. And the first time they had people write out what had happened. And what they found is with every year, the person, people's stories, not just in little tiny details, but in major plot elements, radically changed. But what didn't change is that their, their feeling of confidence that, yes, this is what happened. They even should take a piece of paper and put it across the table from them and say, this is what you wrote. And they look at it and they're like, look, dude, I know that's my handwriting, but let me tell you what really what gets. <laughs> right? So that's, that's why this, this permanent record really, 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 really helpful. Um, it's going to help you once you see your ideas on the, on the paper. Uh, they become something real. You can then stop thinking about that and start thinking of another one. Are you just thinking the same thing again and again and again and again? As you mentioned, you're documenting your process, right? Um, you're also once you get it down, you can think about other things. If you're like trying to remember, like even grocery lists of what you need to pick up on your way home, right? That's part of that limited bandwidth that we have. So um, it's going to free up extra room for thinking. It's going to cue your memory, right? Bring it back to what really happened. And lastly, this process is going to do, give you some routine to follow. So journaling will be a routine that you can follow. When you're not feeling particularly creative or inspired, you'll have some just kind of nuts and bolts things. I'm going to kind of go here, and I'm going to start, you know, I'm going to start weeding the garden. And you're going to kind of know what you're going to do, and you're going to know what you're going to do next. And you're putting yourself in a place where this cascade of creativity will have room to come in. So you'll have sort of a clear routine, kind of starting place for a series of observations. This is externalizing your thinking. And when you do this on, as with, with writing, you're going to put it on a page using both visual and verbal techniques for describing that information. How many people here don't feel comfortable drawing? How many people here don't really feel comfortable writing? Right? So if writing is your happy place, it can be, you're going to start with lots of writing, but you're going to start to incorporate more visual notes with that. Right? If it's the reverse, if you really feel comfortable drawing, it'll be mostly drawing, but you're going to start to intentionally write all over your page. Because these two modes, right, there's this, uh, what is it, the dual theory of sort of uh, concept of information, dual learning. Uh, theory. It says that, that we kind of encode information and we kind of process information using two completely different pathways in our brains for each one of these. And we're going to use those, so intentionally do this. And also when we look at sort of models of uh, working memory, those map the same idea. That we, our working memory has our, um, our, 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 what is it, the uh, visual sketch pad and our phonological loop. 
our brain, our memory is going to encode word stuff and visual stuff in different sorts of ways. So we're intentionally using these both together on the same page. And uh, so if you're going out there in the field and you just sort of like, here's a flower, I'm going to draw this flower, oh, that's great, that's nice. If I'm trying to make a pretty picture, my brain stops there. The minute I start writing all of that, this becomes my thinking process. Right? And what's interesting is the more of these sort of notes you start to get, the more interesting uh, that page becomes. It doesn't have to be a pretty picture. So, for your drawing, if you don't feel comfortable drawing, it's just neuroplasticity thing. It's one of these things where if you start doing it on a regular basis, you're going to learn it. Um, you also are going to emphasize in your drawings just what you can see. If you can't see the duck's feet, you don't draw the duck's feet. You're just going to be drawing what you see. So, you don't have to have a perfect photographic memory. But the more you do it, the better it's going to get. If you're drawing a duck and your duck moves, Right? You just start a new drawing. It moves again. You start a new drawing. It moves again. You start a new drawing. Eventually, it's going to come back to a pose you already started. <laughs> you just jump back to that, continue drawing, and the pose that you get the furthest along on will be the most characteristic view of that thing. Um, but the big picture here is that we're using these drawings to explore and explain what we see, not to make pretty pictures. So it's a tool, not a fetish. We're not worried about pretty pictures. Right? The minute you start making a fetish out of the pictures, you're going to give yourself brain claw. So it's not art, and also with the verbal stuff, we're not worried about grammar and spelling and this sort of thing. So this isn't the place for kind of getting wrapped like, how do I spell phonological, right? right? If, and so maybe I won't even say that because I don't know how to spell it. So um, if you can't spell it, it's still okay to put in the book. Uh, the tools for this are very simple. You just need uh, some simple journaling items. Very often, just a notebook and a pencil is great. Um, I find it's also nice to have a kit that you can easily get out and easily put away. Things to measure with and things to help you see in different ways are great. So that can be hand lenses, magnifiers, binoculars. Those kind of just sort of change your sort of aug augmenting your sort of powers of, of, of observation, right? We talked about sort of the things have to come in through the filter of your senses. This is one way of augmenting your senses. Another thing for measuring is a watch. And then when you go about teaching this stuff, uh, there's a few kind of basic strategies that I find are really high percentage. Um, your major role is to provide the example and the inspiration of what this could be. Um, when I find that when kids, kids will buy into this idea of having their brain kind of out on the page like this. Kids will buy into it and they will authentically want to do it. Um, but what you have to do is provide a compelling example and inspiration for them. Number two, you're going to give them the tools to do it, so not just physical tools like this. I'm going to show you some examples of tools which are kind of uh, ways of kind of framing a project. I come to a place, what would I do in this place to kind of explore it in my journal? That framework for exploration is a tool. So oh, in a moment I'll go over some of those. You want to give kids a chance to do this on a regular basis because then what's going to happen is uh, here we go, practice. It gets better. They're going to start getting better and they're going to see that. And uh, the timing and energy on this is a big deal. Um, if you've got a bunch of really hyperactive kids and you say, sit down, concentrate, draw this flower, they are not going to be cooperating with you. Right? Um, hike them, get them tired. Right? Read the energy of the group. You need to, so this is stuff that takes focus. So if people are just bouncing off the walls, we'll often do a different activity. We'll go out into the creek. We'll explore around. We'll find cool critters, uh, examine those, verbally ask questions and kind of get into it. And then when people get really hooked by something they're authentically curious about, then this is absolute gold. And lastly, giving students feedback is important. 
The kids want your approval. They want to know that they're doing it the right way. Um, what, by the way, is the most common thing that comes out of a grown-up's mouth when a kid says, look at this drawing that I did? Exactly. We say, how pretty. They say, good job, how pretty. Right? It comes just, it's right there waiting on the tip of our tongue, right? So here's the problem. I'm telling the kids, it's not about the pretty pictures. Don't worry about the drawing. Don't worry about the art. The kid shows me their stuff and they go like, oh, great job. That's beautiful. What? Oh, that looks so good. You did a really good job. That looks really pretty. <laughs> Old street cred gone. Right? The kid who shows you their journal is going to be the one who always gets positive feed uh, feedback from having the pretty pictures on their journal. Right? The kid over there who didn't show you their journal, who you got to take a risk and make some drawings, they're like, oh, I get it. This is one of those grown-up tricks again. Right? I see what's going on here. Well, you got me this time. Let's see if you get me again. So here's the problem. You need to get positive reinforcement. You need to support the kids in doing this. But we're not going to be saying, good job, pretty picture. What, what are our objectives in journaling? Why are we doing it? To help us remember it. Curiosity. To enhance our curiosity. Externalize those, those, those observations. All right, so we want to get those observations, and get them down onto the paper. So all I have to do is just be a mirror and bounce back to them what I'm observing they observed. Or what I'm observing they asked. I say, I'm going to read some of the notes and say, that's a really interesting question. Wow, I haven't thought about that. What a great question. Or this is a, what a cool observation. You notice that the deer's ears are kind of up at an angle like that and then it turns. You have the little note there that it turns. Right? Or um, that you uh, observe the, the, the spacing between these, these leaves on the plants or that it has a serrated edge. That's a great observation. Good observation. So I'm just, I see the observation that they documented. I'm just reflecting back to them that they made that observation. And the kids are like, yeah, that's what I observed. That's the way we want to give feedback. Another way that I found is very successful to give feedback to kids is if a kid is using a note-taking strategy that I want other people to do, like I really like the way that you are incorporating some little drawings and diagrams in with your written notes. That's a really good way to do that. And that strategy of just having a couple of pens, you know, eventually you're going to kind of come up with a, a system, that's going to allow you to get notes that are more visually meaningful for you. And it's also a lot more fun. And then she's sitting there thinking, she's thinking like, that's right, checking out. And the kids are going, she, it's a way of patting her on the back, saying good, good strategy. And then you're saying to everybody else, this is an idea that you can steal. So anytime you see a student doing an idea that you can steal, right, um, that other kids can steal, I point that out. So you can give tons of positive reinforcement. Either you're reflecting an observation back to them, or they're using a strategy that you want more kids to use. So the last thing that I want to do is just to give you folks a few examples of what tools could look like. Okay. And uh, the, uh, so this is, uh, so one is what I call the metadata. So this is something that I put on every page. The first, when a kid goes to, to put something on a page, it's really, really intimidating. You've got a blank page staring at back at you. Just have them write the weather, the date, the location. All right? There it is there. Here's a little map. Here's a little bit. Here's where I am, when it is, and what the weather was. The minute I write on that page, it stops feeling like, it starts looking like notes and stops feeling like an art project. So that's a great way to crack in a page. So metadata is something that I like to have in my, my toolkit. Another strategy when you find something that interests you, perhaps an animal or a plant, is to use writing and drawing to start to collect as much information about that organism as you can. And just think of it as a data dump about that thing. Encourage kids to zoom in and zoom out. And I will often ask them, what are some things that are hard to draw and easier to write about this? What would be some, easy, some things that would be easier to make a, a, a sketch of to show and harder to show with, with language? 
And what you do is you get kids on one page, instead of that sort of portrait thing like, here's my flower. You want to get the density of information on a page, all their observations about one thing. And then what happens is those little bits of information start to kind of reinforce each other. Um, and uh, so the, inter the thinking becomes a lot more, more interesting. Here's another strategy. You find something, uh, you find one idea and then find a lot of examples of it and put a collection of those in your journal. So an example of that is uh, heroes out at that pond, that same one, this was uh, before that uh, avian cholera outbreak. Um, but I noticed a bunch of the ducks had these strange brown stains on their chests. So I had been out there just making a bunch of drawings of stains on the chests of birds. Uh, here's a, a collection of things that ice does. So if you have a little project in your head, a little theme, all of a sudden you're walking around and you're looking for more examples of, of the stains on the chest of the bird or weird things that ice does. Having a focus, a little collection like that, is a very powerful way to get yourself and the students to look more deeply. If you're just looking around a place at, say, seed pods, or things that are red, you will notice things that you otherwise would not have seen. Here's another strategy. We talked before about the dual comparison. Okay? Do that directly on a piece of paper. This next to that. I get two things next to each other, here are two, these are, are birds, the wimbrel and the curlew are birds with long down curved beaks. These are ones that were sleeping so that their bills were tucked in. But side by side, I'm doing a comparison of these two things. And you'll notice more about those things when you're able to compare them side by side. Another tool is quantification. So all the mathematicians out there, you can count things up. So this was, I was making some, just sort of some sketches and written observations of this bitter and feeding, but I was also counting over the course of 20 minutes how many uh, critters it caught. So up there, it missed four, caught four bullfrogs, caught one fish. 20 minutes. So you've got a feeding rate popping out of this. So here are measurements, right? So I'm showing that this is life size. Right? Here's quantification showing how big the bush is next to me. So I'm showing how tall this thing is, not by getting my measuring tape out and ruling it, how many centimeters this uh, little shrub is. is um, this might probably be a, sort of a more useful way of kind of visualizing the gender, sort of the general size of this thing. So measuring things, counting things. Um, here is, uh, I am, I've got a, a tree that's being eaten by deer, and I am counting on this one. Uh, there, there are little tiny leaves, this big, down here at the bottom where the deer can nibble. The leaves are bigger, both of these are life size, one by one, one by one, at the top. And then I've got a count of how many, um, how many spines they have on the edge of them. And it turns out, these, this tree was being nibbled by deer. At the bottom of it, there were lots of spines, even though the leaves were, there were more spines, even though the leaves were small. So that's kind of an interesting kind of implication for those ones that are being browsed by deer. They've got more spines, they've got, they're, they're smaller. So there's something, there's a physiological response that seems to be appropriate to deer browsing going on. So this is the kind of pattern that comes out when you start to quantify things. Here was looking at, I was looking at uh, some ducks in a pond, mallard ducks. And some of them seem to have purple heads, some of them seem to have green heads. And then I discovered that the same duck, as it swam around, depending on its angle relative to the sun, it would go from being having a green head to a blue head to a blue head. So I made this little diagram here. Here's the sun. Here's me. And this is depending on which angle the duck is relative to me and the sun, that is the, uh, that is the 
uh, that's going to change the color of the head. You can actually watch them swim past this 90 degree point and go from being a green head duck into a blue and purple head duck. So kind of fun. But this is kind of quantifying those observations. So all of those are examples of tools that you can apply. Um, the, uh, the thing I'm going to leave you with is just sort of a, an example of how you might set this up with a group of kids. And if you want to see more of these, kind of the curriculum part of this, I'm going to suggest that people go to my website, which is johnmuirlaws.com. You can pick up one of my cards here if you want. I have a free downloadable curriculum all about how to do nature journaling. All right. Um, later this year, we're going to come out with a third edition of that, which will be tied into the Next Generation Science Standards. It's as if the, the NJSS was made to do nature journaling. It's just, it's a perfect match. But um, if you walk out to a meadow and say, oh, I want everybody to go find a flower, sit down next to it, and I want you to draw a really good picture of it, okay? you're going to have zero res uh, response from your kids. But envision this. You're now a kid, and here are your instructions. Right? In just a moment, what we're going to do is we're going to go into that little meadow here. The boundaries are I want everybody to stay within that sort of cement path. So we're not going to be going outside of that. Everybody's going to have one minute to first find their secret plant. One plant, an individual plant, out there in that little lawn area. And then what you're going to do is, in your journal, you're going to use both writing and drawing to take notes about it, to describe it in enough detail so that when, uh, at the end of 14 minutes, you're going to come back here, you're going to hear this duck call. When you hear that noise, you're going to come back here. I'm going to give you a partner. And you're going to bring your partner over to the area where you were taking notes. And you're going to say to your partner, all right, my plant is somewhere in this area right here. Here are my notes. Now, which individual plant was I looking at? Not just which kind, but which individual one. If they have trouble, you can narrow down the area for them. But they have to figure out which individual one you were looking at. What are some sorts of clues that you could put in that would really help your partner be able to be 100% sure you want them to be successful? What are clues that you could put in to help them be successful? Tell me a few. That's a question. So how, how, how tall it is? So, you can either, so how can you show height? Relative to other things around it. So you, should, yeah, you can draw it relative to other things around it. So if, uh, you know, for instance, you did that tree there, you, know, you can even draw yourself standing next to it. Um, you, you also um, could put a little uh, line next to it showing how big an inch is, or say that this thing is five inches, or draw it life size and say, I drew this life size. What else could you do? So size is one. What else? Zoom in and out and show where in the area generally it is. Correct. So, you're saying, so zooming in and out of the area, like making kind of a map of what you're looking at. Um, and maybe you can even zoom in more if there's some specific little detail that's like a clincher. You can even do an enlargement of that. So zooming in and out instead of one portrait. What else? That's great. Great. If you only have a pencil, what are some good ways of showing color? Yeah, so you can describe that color compared to other things. You could write in the colors, draw a little line. So the kids will generate their little list. Anybody have any questions about the rules? We've only got 14 minutes. If there is somebody, uh, I want everybody to be spaced out enough so that the person that you're not going to distract other people and other people near you won't be distractions. If there is somebody that you really want to be your partner, make sure that person isn't sitting anywhere near you because you don't want them to see which one you're doing. Do those two kids are always talking to each other? Right? And if you finish before everybody else, what I'd like you to do is to remain seated where you are and see if you just add other layers of details. For instance, maybe making a map, finding a totally different avenue of including information. Um, for instance, if you're mostly drawing, to add more, more, more writing at that point. Um, instead of getting up because then you'll see where everybody else is working. On your mark, get set. Kids are out there, and what you'll find is that kids are incredibly successful at this. And instead of kind of drawing that generic flower that they always do, they've got that specific one there. The feedback 
um, they come back, how many people were able to find their partner's plan? Because you built in that thing where if they have trouble uh, identifying it, they can narrow down the area, everybody's successful. And what are some things that your partner did to make it helpful for you to, to, to find your plan? Then you've got kids telling other kids the sorts of things that they can include in their notes. Those are really effective strategies. That's an example of one of the activities in the curriculum book. Uh, that's the free download. Now these are these are kid tested, um, and it's a ton of fun. So I would suggest to you that starting to externalize your thinking onto a nature journal, uh, actively using writing and drawing getting kids over that fear of either writing because they don't know how to spell it or drawing because they are not one of the artists. It is probably one of the biggest gifts that you can give a kid. More important than memorizing the crib site. As beautiful as it is. <laughs> um, you're teaching the kids a process and a tool, giving them a tool that they can apply to anything in their life. And yeah, that's a lot of fun. Yes? Do you have a rule about adding color or details after you're not in the field anymore? Yeah, um, I, I, that's a, a really good question. There's a couple of different strategies on it. Um, the best way I've seen it handled was by uh, an artist, illustrator, and scientist named William D. Berry. And what he would do is, next to a little note that he would take, he would have the word life written. And that was drawn from life. Or it'd be life and mem. So this was life and memory, sort of added at the end. Um, or sometimes he would like it would be, you know, memory and ref. So he's sitting at home remembering it and using reference material. Right? And putting those things together. So he would add into his he'd sort of insert metadata into his note table. Um, I can make cases for doing all those things. Um, but what I don't recommend doing is making sketches out in the field, then kind of looking at it going like, oh dear, well oh, I totally got that wrong, for erasing it, because you're looking at a field guide, and copying what's in the field guide. Um, I actually did that when I was a student at Berkeley. I was walking across the UC Berkeley campus here, and I saw this beautiful bird with a yellow throat in a tree next to me, and I drew a very, several very careful pictures of it in my journal, because I was actually carrying my journal all the time in this part of what was in my backpack. So I was journaling this thing. Then I got home and I looked at my, my, my field guides and I thought, okay, here's the yellow throat. And boy, did I get that wrong. And so I erased all these details, copied the picture out of the book, put in common yellow throat, found outside sprawl. Right? If any birders in here, you'd be like, that doesn't quite sound like yellow throat habitat. Right? Um, next day I was walking across campus, there's that same yellow bird and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know what? I was right. I had taken a uh, yellow rump warbler, which has a yellow throat, and <coughs> correctly drawn it, erased those details, drew a common yellow throat over it. And so from that point on, I never sort of modified my drawings based on what should be right from some other reference to it. But I really like the way William D. Barry does it, of, of writing life, um, um, or mem, or ref, or mem and ref in there with those sort of things. So it's just part of the metadata of what you're doing. The more you do, the better it will get. Drawing is not a gift, it's not a magical trait that you have. The more you do it, the better it will get. So um, are there any other? It looks like probably the next group is ready to come in. Are they ready? All right. I hope this was useful to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Um, if I can give any other help to you, grab one of my cards, you can get in contact with me, cold call me anytime. The other is, if you want to get better at your own nature journaling, Nature Journal Club, free nature journal uh, workshops every month in Oakland and other locations around the Bay Area, and also uh, free monthly field trips. And um, you can, uh, and students are invited and encouraged to come. And we've got really good potlucks. Thank <laughs> you.